Get ready to step into scripture with Tina. Hey everyone, welcome to Step Into Scripture. My name is Tina Wilson. I'm a pastor's wife and a mom of seven. Alongside my husband, Matt, I've committed my life to serving King Jesus as a church planter, a Bible teacher, an author, and an advocate for all in family ministry. I'm passionate about making Christ and his church famous, and I'm also passionate about helping people develop an open-ended commitment to reading the entire Word of God, Genesis to Revelation. This is something I do together with women in my church year after year. And on this podcast, we hope to be able to open Scripture to people, help it be more understandable, more applicable to life. And in this series that we have started now for season three, we are talking about marriage, and we're doing that using what the Bible says in the book of Song of Solomon. So we're walking chapter by chapter through this book in this season, and I'm so honored to have my friend and mentor, Allison Harris, joining me for this. Allison, if you would, just go ahead and share a little bit about yourself. Hi, my name's Allison Harris. I'm also a pastor's wife, and uh, uh, Jerry and I have been serving at The Crossing for a long time. I've been in ministry over 40 years, and uh, so I'm still alive to tell about it. And then Tina called me and asked me to talk about, of all the books in the whole Bible, yes, Song of Solomon. So here we are, and I'm excited and honored to be here. So don't undersell yourself here. Let's tell the truth. (laughs) Allison and Jerry lead incredible marriage retreats for people where they speak this truth into them. So I believe you are uniquely qualified to unpack this book well, of the Bible. We're going to find out, but I it's it's kind of fun. The more I learn, the more I like it. Awesome. So. so also on this episode, I want to introduce you all to my oldest daughter, Riley. We've asked her to be on this episode because we are talking specifically about the phase of romance that is engagement, the time just before marriage. Riley, this is the time that you're in. So if you don't mind, introduce yourself. Share a little bit about your relationship if you'd like. Okay, I'm Riley. I do worship ministry and student ministry at Ecclesia Christian Church, and apparently it's relevant today that I'm engaged. (laughs) (laughs) And you're getting married when? January 13th. January the 13th. So we are looking forward to that. Now, Let's just do a quick recap from episode one. If you have not listened to the last episode, episode one in season three, you want to start there in Song of Solomon chapter one. That chapter deals with dating and courtship. Allison opened us up with some great context to help us better understand that. I think one of the key points that we've got to hang on to here is that this is poetry. Right. So we're not looking... This is not theology. This is poetry. Understand that it's poetry and... You know, and just kind of go with it. Understand that it's not your culture, but there are things in here that God is so creative and he's so good at, and he shows that he's actually fun, and he knows how people are made because he made us. Yes. So we talked about in that episode the importance of attraction, that that's something that God created. Yes. It's not something that's bad. We talked about some body image issues. We saw that this woman who is the subject and the main speaker in this poem is not a woman who is the pinnacle of the beauty standard of her day, and that's important because it makes her relatable to all of us. We talked about the importance in the dating phase of spending time together, desiring to spend time together, of uh, expressing affirmation and affection toward one another, and of having a common goal and seeing yourself with a common future. Because if you can't do that, you know, something I've always told you and your sisters is date for marriage, right? Mm -hmm. If you cannot see yourself with this person for the long haul, there's really no point in dating Yeah, common goals. What are your common goals? Yeah, you're just setting up for heartbreak Yeah, if that can exist. So now we're going to keep moving. We're going to start in the beginning of Chapter 2. And like Allison shared in Episode 1, we've got three different voices here that are speaking. Yeah, we have the voice of the woman, uh, the voice of the man. And we don't know who the woman is. We don't know if the if the female is an individual or a collection of female individuals. But we're... for. For poetry's sake, we're going to say woman, same for man. We don't know if it was Solomon or men who wrote poetry on behalf of King Solomon. And then we have the audience. Yes. So, Riley, if you don't mind, just open us up. Let's read these first seven verses in chapter two. Clue us into who's speaking here, and then we'll start unpacking it. Okay. So, Song of Solomon chapter two starts with the woman. 
She says, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. And the man says, like a lily among thorns is my darling among the young women. And the woman says, like an apple among the trees of the forest is my beloved. Among the young men, I delight to sit in his shade and his fruit is sweet to my taste. Let him lead me to the banquet hall and let his banner over me be love. Strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. His left arm is under my head and his right arm embraces me. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. So this woman here begins to speak in this chapter, and she's speaking modestly. Mm -hmm. This rose of Sharon isn't a great translation, and in your Bible, you probably have a little, if you're reading a digital Bible, A that you can tap on that's going to give you an alternate translation. If you're reading a paper Bible, there's probably a footnote down at the bottom that, that indicates to you Rose is not really what we're aiming at. We read that and we think she is affirming herself. She mm -hmm. is saying that she is someone of great beauty. Rather, she's making a statement that she's kind of like a wildflower. Right. She's one of the more common desert flowers. So this statement could more accurately be I am a wildflower of Sharon, a common lily of the valleys. So we talked in the last episode about her statement, I'm dark. The beauty standard of the day was to be light skin. That would indicate wealth, aristocracy. I don't have to work. She's not that. She's dark. And here she's kind of expressing the same thing again, that, that she is not um, the, the top tier beauty of the day. Mm-hmm. She's a humble woman. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is poetry, so you have some freedom to interpret how you are. This is not a salvation issue, so we have some freedom here. I think she's sitting under an apple tree, which, by the way, back then, apple trees were, that was a big deal. To have a good fruit-producing apple tree was a very big deal. I think she's dreaming, Yeah. honestly. Yeah. I think, and man, wouldn't it be awesome if, fill in blank. Yeah, but, but then he... Yeah. steps in and and now we have his words whether in her dreams or in reality again none of this is is to be read as a literal sequence of events mm -hmm. but what we find important is him affirming her where she says I'm, I'm a common wildflower a common lily he speaks to her in security and says well if you're just a lily then all other women are just thorns. Like, he is speaking to her, directly affirming her this in the This guy gets space. an A for uh, timing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's a quick one. Yeah, he's, he's on it. <laughs> he's got the really good response. And, and then she affirms him in the same way. And I think something important that we need to recognize here as relationships progress, and especially when you are thinking about entering in to an engagement is that the person who you're choosing, your person, Riley, your fiance, that is the standard of attractiveness for you. You are the standard of attractiveness for him. Mm -hmm. He is engaged to you because he does not find blondes more attractive than brunettes, right? right? Like it doesn't matter what the culture around you says. God is bringing the two of you together and you are one another's perfect match. So we see that affirmation there. So Riley, you know, this is something you and I have been talking about, mm -hmm. right? When you and Bryson first got engaged or before you got engaged, actually, that's the time that this conversation needs to happen. When you were talking about wanting to get engaged, he was coming to your dad talking about wanting to propose to you. One of the things I said to you is, this is important that you're recognizing that in entering an engagement, you are saying you are the single man who I am attracted to, who I'm going to pursue intimacy with for the rest of my life, mm -hmm. right? So if, if there's a problem there when you're in the dating phase, if you're saying, well, you know, I like this guy, I'm attracted to him, but I also am kind of having some feelings for this other guy. That's not a relationship that needs to progress to the engagement phase. And that's mm -hmm. something that, that I asked you pretty directly. Like, are you ready to say that you are never, for the rest of your life, 
going to be interested in any sort of uh, relationship, intimacy with any other man other than Bryson. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely great parenting and the, the wonderful response. In and I'm going to go back to history. In history, when you're engaged and when that question is proposed to you, Riley, if you lived back then, it was pretty much done. That it was signed, it was sealed. The wedding was a was a party. Yeah. Not not like okay. At any given time, I can back back this up and forget about it. But like in Jesus' time, when the when the pat when the cup is passed and the veil is lifted and she drinks the cup, we've had no wedding, but we have contract. Yeah. So you're in it to win it now. But so. that's still that's definitely good practice for us, even if the culture is different. Right. Man, don't keep walking into a relationship toward engagement if you're not ready for that exclusive commitment. That's just setting, again, everyone up for heartbreak. Just like in the dating right. phase, you can't see yourself building a home, building a future with this person. Stop dating. If you are not 100% sure this is your exclusive other, don't proceed toward engagement. And mm -hmm. as if you are walking into marriage. Another thing that I love here that the woman says is she talks about sitting in his shade and his banner over her is love. So she talks about him being her covering here. Yes. He is a place where she finds protection, where she feels provided for, and not just physically, right? Like you're getting married. A lot of our conversations between your dad and your fiance have centered on what does the plan look like here? If you are taking my daughter as your wife, you are going to have to physically provide, meet her needs. That's a requirement. But but she's voicing here that he's not only meeting her physical needs, she feels emotionally protected by him also. And that's a huge thing. A man needs to be protecting his wife Physically, obviously, if someone breaks in in the middle of the night, I'm not going after him. I'm waking mm -hmm. up Matt. He's going to get the gun. He's going to protect the family. Mm -hmm. He's uniquely equipped by God to do that. He's stronger than me. But also a man needs to be protecting his wife emotionally and spiritually. This stuff where women are in relationships where they're in a constant state of emotional turmoil, there's all these ups and downs. That's not the picture that we're seeing here of what this incredible relationship looks like in these Holy Spirit inspired writings. Right. This is uh, what I love about this writing is this is not intended to show that he's weak so that she has to cover him. He has to cover her. Yeah. That's his responsibility. He was yeah. wired this way. He was made this way. And, and, and she in turn acknowledges and she appreciates the fact, okay, you're doing your job. You're covering for me. And my job is to respect you and tell you 800 times a day how awesome you are. Yeah. Well, this <laughs> you know? is something you and I've even talked about over the last few days. You know, there is, there is an order in creation. Yes. There are specific roles that are designated for men and women in our marriages, our homes, even in the church. And, uh -huh. and something we were talking about yesterday is I don't want that covering role. Like as, as a right. woman in ministry who is a member of a local congregation, who has elders over me in authority in the church, I want that covering. I want that protection mm -hmm. that comes from them. I have no desire to stand in, in my husband's space and have to take on that protector, provider, lead role. And sometimes I think that can get a bad rap because culturally, you know, women want to be able to do everything that men can do. They want to be able to do it just as well as men. And so we don't like things like Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, where we read that women are called to submission to our husbands until we look at the inverse. I may be called to submit to him, but he's called to lay down his life for me. Like whatever right. it takes to provide, that's what he's called to do. And I think when, when that's working both ways correctly, then we really don't have a problem with these roles. Mm -hmm. So you'll see in verse seven, and it repeats uh, in chapter two, verse seven, and it repeats on in the in the in the book more often. And it says, uh, "Do not not to awaken or stir up love until it wants to arise." So this gets really interesting when yeah. you're when you're engaged, 
when you're dating, when you're, I mean, because chemistry is not logical. Chemistry is chemistry. God made it. It's good. It's a good thing. In fact, there are going to be times in marriage, you know, at least, okay, it's just times in my marriage that if, I, we, if we didn't have chemistry, we'd be a sinking ship. Yeah. So, you know, chemistry is great. And what she's saying here in verse 7 is, all right, we're going to do this. It's like this is a time. I'm going to do it, but I can't go there. But I can do this, but I can't go there. And I can do this, and I can't go there. Because you want it, you don't want to stir it up until it arrives. Because if right. it arises and you go over that edge, you're in a whole new world of hurt. Yes. You know, and can you make it up for it? Yeah. Is it the unpardonable sin? No. But there are issues. The cool thing about this whole book is that God knows that. Right. This is thousands of years old, yeah. and we still have body image issues. We have timing issues. We have chemistry issues. We have engagement issues. We got wedding issues. We got yeah. the whole thing. You know, uh, I've had I have two daughters and three weddings, and I'd I I'd love to be the mother of the groom every day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, wear beige, write a check, and show up. It, it was awesome, you know. Yeah, and weddings for girls is a whole a whole new world. You know, so you're going to be great. Well, you're we're, we're leaning great. into it. We're getting ready for it. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we have to pay careful attention to what's said here about pacing the relationship. Yes. In our last episode, Reagan, who's in a dating relationship, spoke to not jumping into boyfriend-girlfriend scenarios at 13 and 14 and 15 years old because you're going to have a very difficult time that early maintaining the slow pace that's going to be necessary when you're starting that early. I mean, a, a relationship comes to a point where it has nowhere else to go but marriage or sin. Mm -hmm. And so the rate at which you cross each new border from holding hands to hugging to kissing, it has to be paced right so that we don't find ourselves awakening something mm -hmm. before the time is right. I, I love it that you and Bryson Riley are you're engaged, but you're there's not a long distance between your wedding. Yes, between your engagement and your wedding. I was engaged for a year and a half. I would not recommend that to my enemy. You know, <laughs> um, and now and sometimes I grew up in a generation. Well, you know, you get married in in 19 X and you get married in 19. Why? Like, there has to be a long time. We have to pay off all our school bills, and we have to buy a house, and we have to do all this. And, and it's forever. No. I'm sorry. I'm going to probably offend somebody here, but I'm not, a, I'm not a proponent of that anymore because I think this shows in Chapter 7, okay, you're going to wait for some financial reasons, but you might not be able to wait in some chemistry issues. Right. And now we got a bigger problem. Riley, something I've heard you say several times is I don't want to be engaged for a really long time. Is that by design? I didn't really see the need to draw it out if we know that we're the right person and we know where we're headed. I didn't see a need to draw it out for longer than what was necessary. Yeah, totally agree. I think it's important for us as parents to talk, especially to our daughters, about not awakening this arousal too early because often it is the girls in relationships who set the boundary, and who have to hold the line. And this is an right. unfortunate truth, but often it is the case that a guy will go as far as he's allowed to go. Right. And then they get to a point where, I mean, chemically, they yes. are made that way. Yes. So then we're asking to do them to do something they're not made or designed to do, and that's not fair. Right, right. My 16-year-old daughter asked me recently, how did you know that dad was the one? When you, when you guys were dating? How'd you know he was the guy that you needed to marry? And I told her my, my first indication was my husband and I have been dating since we got together when I was 16 years old. And at that time, there were many guys who were my friends who I went to school with. And I was friends with them. But I also knew that if they had an opportunity to make a pass, they would. And so the, the sincerity of the friendships, I didn't really know about. I didn't know if they were my friend because we like legitimately enjoyed hanging out or because they might get an opportunity to make a play. Mm -hmm. And when I became friends with Matt, because we were friends for 
at least a year before we ever started dating. And, and in that time, we really were friends. I hung out with him and I never felt like he was looking for an opportunity to push forward with me, to push boundaries with me. He seemed very sincerely interested in just being my friend. And the more I got to know him, the more it became apparent that that restraint in his life came from a commitment to Christ. And once we were dating, I was, before I had even really committed my life to Christ, something I saw in him was that I genuinely believed he loved God more than he liked me. And, and that if I were to push a boundary with him, that that would end the relationship. And that was different. I had never met a guy like that before. I hadn't seen that Mm -hmm. in, in a teenage boy before, like I saw in him. So I had always been the person holding the boundary, holding the line. And now I saw someone who from his commitment to Christ was equally committed to that. And that caused him to be different than any other guy I'd known. And I went, Oh, this might be the guy. Mm -hmm. So Riley, keep us going. Let's keep going through Song of Solomon chapter two. So the woman says, look, my beloved, here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. There he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My beloved spoke to me and said, arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. See, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone, flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come. The cooing of the doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come my darling, come with me. This is a great section of scripture uh, because of what he says here. And what he's saying, remember, in poetic language, in the last of it, where he talks and he says, Arise, come my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. That means, okay, I'm coming, it's time. Yeah. You know, and in the New Testament, it talks about how the bride comes for, or the bridegroom comes for the bride. He is coming for her here too. This is, let's get married. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and he wants to take this relationship to the next level. And um, they've expressed attraction. They've expressed adoration. And I, I love this. I want us to not forget this that God inspired this, he wants this to happen, and now this relationship is ready to move forward. Um, When we do marriage retreats, we talk about four ways that a marriage, you know, how we should know, how we should work in a marriage. Four ways. You should know someone, get to know them, and this is where that dating part is. Then you learn to rely on them. Now, that's, that's when there's there's engagement like Riley and Bryson, and then there's into the first part of the marriage. Yeah. We start to, we, we start to, we trust them. Then we start, so it's no trust, rely. This is where life happens. This is where we do life together. We pay the bills together. We work the kids together. We do our jobs together. We do everything together. And then the last one is touch. And this, and touch is the eros part. But yeah. here's the problem with that. We usually do touch first. Mm. And then all the three come in. Wow. And that just doesn't, that's not how it's designed here. So just right. because we want to look over this book, if we would go back and look at it not good, well, you'll understand that he's doing it in the right order and now he's ready to move on. Yes. So ready to move the relationship forward. Riley, keep us going here. Okay. So in verse 14, the man says, My dove in the clefts of the rock, in the hiding places on the mountainside, show me your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. And the woman says, My beloved is mine and I am his. He browses among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the rugged hills. So he has proposed marriage. He came bounding across the hills, so eager to get to her. Let's take this thing to the next level. And now he is seeing her. She's in the clefts of the rock, the hiding place. He's beckoning her out. Come show your face. So she's maybe a little hesitant at this point. Maybe she's not immediately responding to his proposal. So this does not look like your proposal. I know that when you got engaged recently, you were totally ready for it. Nails were done. (laughs) 
We were ready for a ring to be on the finger, but this girl in this scenario is maybe a little bit hesitant and maybe we can learn something from that, that at this point, you're ready to move to engagement. One person in the relationship says, let's take the next step. If you're not sure, take a minute. Maybe take a step back. Maybe have a little bit of distance because, well, something I found to be true is, is when you're not sure about something, some distance will let you know how badly you really do want to be with that person. Matt and I, when we had been dating for a few years, then I graduated from high school. I went away for a year of college. Like I said in our last episode, drove a thousand miles a week just to spend extra time with him. Some distance made me know how badly I wanted to be near him and how much I longed for that time. So sometimes some distance can help us not take each other for granted, Mm -hmm. can help us really size up how badly do I want this. And I love what he says to her here. If you're going to take some time, then catch the foxes. That is great advice. He says, before we move forward in this relationship, let's catch the foxes because foxes ruin vineyards. So here I I want you to think of this vineyard. This is the place where love is blooming. This is the Mm -hmm. relationship. And before you move to engagement and commit to marriage, you need to assess, are there foxes in this relationship? I mean, some foxes could be, for instance, I knew a woman who got engaged to a man and then found out that he had a box of letters from an ex-girlfriend that he had kept and it really mm-hmm. broke her heart and and so she told him that's not going to work for me and then together they burned that catch the foxes right mm-hmm. i have um done some counseling over the last year, actually myself been in counseling and something that uh, the counselor I was working with, Dr. Wes Beavis said to me is he used this very scripture about catching the foxes and he said, foxes burrow. So when you need to set a guard around your vineyard, around your peace, around your relationship, you need to catch the foxes, get them out of the garden Build the, build the boundary, build the fence, and then walk the perimeter of it every day and check for burrowing foxes. So this is not something. they hide. Yeah. Yeah, they hide. Yeah. So yeah. I would tell you, Riley, you know, as you're moving into marriage, you need to first catch the foxes. If there's anything that is going to be an intrusive, invasive, destructive force that could find a place in your marriage, number one, catch it and get it out. But then you need to check your perimeter Mm -hmm. regularly and say, is any of that trying to find its way back in? Are any new threats trying to find their way in? Yeah, this gets really messy when if you're a blended marriage. Yeah. Like the 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 foxes or the way the things that might come in. Are are you, you know, how what are your parenting styles? Yeah. What are what do you what family history, religious history are you bringing in? Mm-hmm. Is, is your family Catholic and your family Buddhist? And how are we going to work out? Those are those are foxes that get yeah. into the vineyard, and we got to figure out how to work them. This woman is definitely fearful. She should be fearful. She's given him enough impression that uh, he can ask, and he's going to get a yes. Yeah. Because remember, if men can't win, they're not going to play. Yeah. So you know. <laughs> She's given him enough, hey, you can come ask the question. But she's not, he's not asking her because he never asks her. He has to ask the father and the father's family. Okay, yeah. well, what if the fox in the, uh, is the family? Wow. You know, okay, now we got a whole mess of foxes in the vineyard. Now we got to work on that. But it's not that it can't be worked out, but, yeah, it, there's some. That's why she's a little bit fearful, like, I hope daddy likes you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and here's the time to catch the foxes before... You're in the marriage. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that God can't be redeemed if if you're going on to a second marriage. Or, you know, and and the children. It's just uh, common goals and conversations. Yeah. Common goals and conversations. Man, that's true. I didn't even think about that. Foxes can be family. I was sharing with um, Allison the other day that I feel like with Bryson, we hit the jackpot with the family. Mm -hmm. We love them. Great family. Super thankful that it's not a fox. To be caught. Mm-hmm. 
and put out. I'm so glad that our families are able to get together. Yeah, I have and two so well. two daughter in laws and and one son in law, and I think I love them more than my children. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did I did well. That's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. All right, Riley, keep us going here. The woman says, all night long on my bed, I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him, but did not find him. This part of the poem describes a dream sequence. The woman is on her bed all night, but she's looking for her man. In the last chapter, we saw her hesitancy to accept the marriage proposal. She was guarded. She took a step back, and she needed time to catch the foxes. Sometimes when a relationship is progressing, we need to take a step back and evaluate if this is what we really want. Before marriage is the time to make this determination, not after you've entered into a lifelong covenant. So in this next verse, the woman says, I will get up now and go about the city through the streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him, but did not find him. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. Have you seen the one my heart loves? Scarcely I had passed them when I found the one my heart loves. I held him and would not let him go till I had brought him to my mother's house, the room of the one who conceived me. (laughs) It's lovely. (laughs) Okay, so yeah, that verse gets kind of awkward when you read it. You're like, seriously, is that really what it means? (laughs) No, it's not what it means. Remember, it's poetry. So what it means is... She's taking him home to meet mom and dad. Yeah. Mom and dad are, cut, you know, and in, in that time, everybody lived in one house. So, you know, yeah, is it awkward poetry? Would, it, would I have said it? No. You know, but if you're into poetry, this is all about it. So, yeah. you know, it, it, he just, she wants to take him home to meet her parents. Yes. And she's afraid he's going to get away. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and in classic, most, at least, okay, just from my experience, insecurity that 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 can drive that's a driving force sure yeah so so then she repeats what we already saw earlier Mm -hmm. in this sequence verse five she says daughters of jerusalem i charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires again what are we saying here don't excite sexual desire before it can be satisfied and fulfilled sex is a gift from god but it's designed to be engaged in in a monogamous marriage covenant. And I love the intentionality that this phrase is repeated here when she seems to have accepted the marriage proposal. Mm -hmm. He asked, she was kind of standoffish, but now she goes, okay, I want to bring you home to meet my mama. But it's... Where he will ask for... And then he will ask permission. And if yes. the parents say yes, you're done. You're yeah. already married. Yes. Technically. But not till then. So right. even here in this very close space to them being able to engage sexually, she still says, not yet. And I think the engagement period is probably, well, it was for me. It was the hardest time to hold on to that commitment. Because at this point, we're thinking, okay. But we're getting married soon. I mean, for them, maybe Mm -hmm. it's in a few days. For you, maybe it's in a few months, right? But it's it's just around the corner. Why does it really matter if I do it then or if I go ahead and do it now? And something that we've talked about, that I've talked about with you, that I've also talked about with Reagan, and that she spoke to a little bit in the last episode, is that I think we don't realize how much mistrust we may be creating in our marriages when we rush ahead, when we do fulfill these desires before the appropriate time that God's Mm -hmm. given to us. Because if God said the standard is that sex is for a monogamous, committed couple in the covenant of marriage, and we have premarital sex anyway, then what we're doing is we're violating God's standards. And if we would sin against God sexually before we're married, who's to say we're not going to be tempted to sin against God sexually after we're married? Like that, that maintaining God's standard is really a, a gift you're giving your spouse You're giving them the ability to trust in, like I was describing about Matt, like I really do love God more than my attraction to you. And so I'm going to honor God. And in that way, I'm going to honor you. 
and I'm not going to engage in sexual misconduct. And then you can trust me when we're married. I'm still not going to engage in sexual misconduct. I would have a much harder time seeing a man who would not sleep with his fiance before he was supposed to sleeping with someone who wasn't his wife after he was married. Mm -hmm. So something I think we can get from this is that our premarital abstinence, this phase that you're in right now needs to be linked, not as much to the strength of our willpower, although willpower does figure into it, but more to the depth of our love for God, to our commitment to him that says, I hear your word I know you know what's best for me, and I love you, and I want to honor you, and so I'm going to walk this out in the way that you've directed. Mm -hmm. So after this, we move into verse 6, and that begins the actual wedding processional. Mm -hmm. So this couple is going to get married. Riley, it's a few months away from you yet, but we're going to dive into this next phase of Song of Solomon in our next episode, episode 3, and we are going to have a guest with us who is doing that walk in just one week from now. So join us back. We'll see you then.